Hello. Here's a quick disclaimer. Due to some technical issues, the sound quality of this podcast will be good rather than excellent. But fear not, the quality of the content will be as good as usual. Have a good podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Phil. I'm a master's student in biochemistry. And I am Mateus, a master's student in biomedical engineering. You are listening to Orders of Magnitude the podcast in which we talk about science at all scales, from the smallest amino acid to the biggest macromolecule. Right, today we received Maya Nikolova, a student in molecular biology at the University of Montreal who studies proteins, more specifically proteins that are involved in the development of certain cancers. But what are proteins? That's what we discussed first, because we know we are three biochemists who studied biochemistry, proteins are second or third language, and we really want to nail it for you guys at home who haven't heard about protein aside from what you eat in your meals. Mm -hmm. We talked about examples of proteins, what they do, their function, and we also talked about techniques to look at proteins and see what they look like, such as cryo-EM or protein crystallography. Exactly. We also discussed a technique Maya uses in her lab called BioID, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much it. We hope you guys enjoy and have a good time. Have a good time, guys. Maya, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's so nice to have you. So, uh, what do you do as a scientist and how did you get into science? Um, So, right now I'm doing my master's in molecular biology at the University of Montreal. And, well, how did I get into science? We, um, together we did our uh, bachelor's degree in biochemistry and I think... uh, just throughout that whole process, I would just learn more about science, learn more about molecular biology, and just want to keep learning. So um, I just kept going. I don't know, just curiosity, I guess. Exactly. Would you have done another science than biochemistry? Um, I mean, I think about that a lot, and po- possibly. <laughs> and I think a lot of things in science interest me, but uh, I'm still really passionate about what I'm doing now, so uh, I'm, I'm just going with it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so your research, we'll jump further into your research later, but we know that it's, it has to do with proteins, and as we were talking before, proteomics. So the idea that we had at the beginning was to start by talking simple. What are proteins? Can you tell us a little bit of your understanding of proteins, what they are? Uh, yeah, it's a bit complicated to answer that question because I think when we explain what something is we talk about its function but the thing with proteins is that they have so many different functions Uh, different proteins do so many different things Uh, so I think it's probably easier just to start about talking about just in general like proteins are macromolecules so basically fairly big molecules Um, they're things that organisms possess from humans to bacteria to plants even viruses which are technically not living um and um yeah they're made by the cell and they have they're pretty much the machines that do the heavy lifting in the cell yeah we're we're made of like trillions of cells uh, and in each of these cells the protein is a smaller component, right? Exactly. And how, how many proteins uh, can a cell, for example, a human cell make? How many types of proteins can it make? Uh, like tens of thousands. So I probably close to actually hundreds of thousands. Like, I don't, I don't know if we know the exact number. We know that humans have uh, 20,000 genes, but one gene can make, can be coding for many proteins. So my cell has DNA and the DNA codes for proteins. Exactly, exactly. The DNA is like the recipe book which tells the cell which proteins to make. Um, And typically you have a gene which is a short sequence of DNA and that will be like the code that is used by the cell to know how to make the corresponding protein to that gene. So I have 20,000 genes, and out of these 20,000 genes, there's like the instructions to make more 
20,000 proteins and even more? Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on <clears throat> how that gene is read. So the gene can be read in different ways. Um, and that is what will kind of be resulting in different proteins. But I would say like the proteins coming from one single gene are somewhat similar because they do come from that mm -hmm. one gene. Right? Mm -hmm. So if to, to make sure that we understand proteins, there are many of different proteins inside of a single cell. Many different proteins do different things. They don't all look the same. They look different from each other, talking about the proteins. So what, what is happening, for example, when, uh, when someone's heavy lifting, going to the gym, and they have that huge bucket of whey, and <laughs> they want to drink that after, after the workout. They're eating protein, right? It's a protein supplement. Uh, in that sense, I imagine most of our listeners, they understand of protein as protein supplements. Do, do you have an idea of what the protein supplement is and how it relates to the proteins that we're talking about now? Uh, yeah, so that's just a, one example of what a protein is. And when you eat protein supplements, you're uh, simply using those proteins, the cell, the, your cells are going to break them down and use those parts to make new proteins, other proteins with a lot of other functions. Um, so maybe I can talk a bit about how proteins are made since mm. it will help our discussion a lot. So yes. proteins are made of smaller building blocks called amino acids. Mm. And there's a total of 20 amino acids that are being used. And um, different proteins will be different um, combinations of those 20 amino acids. The same as how the different words in the dictionary are combinations of different, of the same 26 letters. Uh, so in that same sense, when a protein is made, these amino acids will be assembled in a chain um, based on the instructions uh, in your DNA. And then uh, once you have that chain of amino acids, it will in a way fold onto itself and uh, make the 3D structure of the protein. And so that chain of the amino acids, the amino acids in that chain is what determines the structure of the protein. And then the structure of the protein is what determines its function. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And just to give an idea to the listeners of the orders of magnitude that we're talking here, the sizes that we're talking here, you, you mentioned an amino acid and uh, you, you started by saying that proteins are macromolecules, big molecules, mm -hmm. but you just said that they're made by amino acids. Mm -hmm. how, how, how big are the things here? Do you have like a comparison of, for example, if we're comparing to water, is it too big, much bigger than water, much smaller? How big is it compared to the cell, for example? Um, it's quite a bit smaller than the cell. I, I would say the average protein is probably uh, 10 nanometers in size, which is a hundred thousand times smaller than a millimeter, if mm. that gives an idea. Whoa, yeah. it's, so it's, it's not something you can see just with your eyes, but it's also not something you can see with a regular microscope, mm -hmm. whereas cells you can see under a regular microscope. So you need other techniques to be able to see um, proteins. Mm -hmm. Although, okay, I say this and it's slightly inaccurate. There are maybe if proteins, many proteins come together to form a complex, then that can be seen with a, with a microscope. A microscope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Depends on the scale. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's summarize everything because we're biochemists and we've explained a lot of very complex concepts that seem obvious to us, but maybe not to the public. So this protein is this sequence of amino acids, like little beads you would stitch together to make some, to make some bead necklace. Mm -hmm. However, the bead, the, the bead necklace goes around your neck, but instead of that, the protein folds up onto itself depending on the properties of these beads. Exactly. For example, if a bead is negatively charged and there's a bead that's positively charged, they will come together because of the laws of electricity. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So proteins, they have, you mentioned, we said, they have many, many different functions. I think Phil, you had a couple of examples of proteins you wanted to show to uh, present to Maya. You want to go over Yeah, exactly. Now? So um, these proteins, how do they acquire their function anyway, before we go into mm. all these cool examples? Yeah, so 
uh, as we were talking, the different proteins will uh, have a different structure depending on uh, their, the amino acids that uh, compose them. And really, it's that structure which will determine uh, their function, which will determine uh, what role they have uh, in the cell. And um, um, so yeah. it's the shape, the shape of the protein, how the shape that it has determines the function that it, whatever it will do, right? Uh, in a simplistic way, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Is there more to it? it? There's definitely more to it, but. Uh, um, it's, I guess, like the example that Phil gave, the, for example, the different properties of the amino acids that compose the protein will mm. have an effect on its structure, like, oh, sorry, on its, both on its structure and its function. function. What properties are we talking about? Yeah, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty. I really yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah, so you mentioned charge. So if it's uh, positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral, that would have an effect. Um, I would say just the, 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 the size of the amino acid as well. Mm -hmm. Some amino acids are bigger, some are smaller. That can have an effect. Mm -hmm. um, There's some amino acids that prefer being around water. Others that like dry, not dry, but water less space. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be one other property. Yeah. That's very cool. Okay, so I think we all get it. We have... A gene that encodes for a protein. The protein is a sequence of amino acid. The sequence of amino acids folds up. And because of the shape, but also, like you said, because of the properties, it has a function in the cell. So let's go through a couple of proteins. Let's play the game I like to call name the protein and its function. Ah, oh, that's a long name. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to name to you a few proteins and you can tell me um, whether how they look, what they look like, uh, what structure they have, and or what they do in the cell. Uh, let's start with actin. Uh, so actin is like a rope or a string. It uh, its function is kind of like a, a railroad. It uh, it um, it allows for transport of different proteins or other um, molecules in the cell from one compartment of the cell to another mm -hmm. uh, and also to helps with the structure of the cell itself like to keep it uh, to keep the cell like structured yeah mm -hmm. cells are like made of yeah. lipids right they're made of fat so they're like flimsy so it's uh, actin that makes them strong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, myosin now or dynein or yeah so uh you mentioned actin, and there's also uh, tubulin, which has sim similar uh, structure to actin, kind of like the railroads. The road, yeah. And uh, so both of these proteins that you mentioned, they'll they kind of look like legs, <laughs> like they'll take steps along the actin uh, ropes or the tubulin ropes, and they'll transport things from one compartment of the cell to another. Mm -hmm. They're bipedal proteins that just run on the railroad. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they literally look like they have legs. Mm -hmm. um, I have green fluorescent protein. That says itself. But... Yeah, it's it's a very glowy protein. I forget from which organism it comes from. It's jellyfish. not it's not a human protein. No. Is it jellyfish? It's a the one the protein that helps jellyfish to uh to glow. glow. Yeah, it was yeah. not green, but uh, we, we made it green, right, eventually, I think that was the oh. story. I, I think it was green originally, but we made yellow fluorescent oh, protein yeah. and like other color, red fluorescent pro protein as well. Yeah. So mm. all of these colors, in my lab we use M-cherry, a red protein. Uh, right. I think it is the right protein. So, so it's just a protein that glows in the dark? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Exactly, a protein for fun, you know. Uh, <laughs> I have here uh, the ribosome. So, I know it's a complex one. Yeah, the ribosome is a protein that makes proteins. What? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it'll use that information uh, encoded in the gene. Uh, actually, that it, the information from the gene will first be copied onto uh, a transcript called 
RNA, and that will be read by the ribosome and will make the proteins in the mm -hmm. cell. Mm -hmm. So it translates the language of DNA to the language of amino acids. Exactly, exactly. To make a new protein. Yeah. A protein that makes a protein. Who would have thought? <laughs> What came first? We can't know. <laughs> um, I have here insulin. Uh, insulin is... Um... <laughs> It's okay if you don't remember. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I know, uh, I know what it is, but I wouldn't know how to uh, explain its structure or its. Uh... Yeah. Me neither. I just put it in my list without oh. knowing. So <laughs> we're, we're we're just gonna skip this one. What is insulin? <laughs> you guys will have to Google it. <laughs> An extremely cool protein, ATP synthase. Oh, that's nice oh ATP synthase is um, like a, a, a rotor or um, a, you know, like a, a generator. So it sits on. Uh, the mitochondrion and it the power of the, yeah, yes. <laughs> and it makes energy and it's quite literally spinning so it's a really cool one yeah mm. so it's exactly like a hydro turbine yeah exactly <laughs> like uh you know like in a hydraulic plant mm. where a current of water is used to to make energy it's it's a very similar concept to that yeah so life figured it out before us eh? yeah yeah Okay, three more and then we get to your research. The proteasome. Oh, the proteasome is like the recycling bin of the cell. So uh, it looks like a cylinder with like a um, empty center and proteins will uh, be targeted to go into it and recycled. Recycled? What do you mean by recycled? What happened to the proteins? Yeah, they're going to be breaking up. Uh, into smaller parts so mm. and, into and, the amino acids yeah exactly okay. which can then be like reused to make more proteins and the ribosome <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Hey, okay. it's all linked up together it's biology cells are very sustainable then <laughs> yeah really cool. yeah okay um the spike protein oh the spike protein is uh on the uh, you know on the covid virus mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. um and it's the the protein that the virus is going to use to like make contact with human cells and be able to infect those cells right yeah mm -hmm. so that is a huge range of functions right ropes to make the cells stiffer uh, glowing in the dark making more proteins uh, virus infecting us and a trash can Wow, <laughs> that is a lot of proteins. A recycling center. A right, <laughs> recycling center, exactly. That's really nice. So a lot of proteins in there. There's many, many proteins in the cells and you clearly understand a lot about them, probably because that's what your project is mostly about, right? Why don't you tell us a little bit of what you're doing for your masters? Sure, sure. So my project is focused on a specific protein. That protein is called RAS mm -hmm. and it's a fairly famous protein. It was discovered quite a few years ago and it's been quite studied ever since because it's mutated in cancer. Uh, actually, about a quarter of cancers have RAS, which is mutated. A quarter of cancers? Yeah. Are there yeah. some types of cancers that have more RAS mutation? Yeah, uh, pancreatic cancer, cancer lung cancer, um, colorectal cancer, All three of these cancer types have a, a high percentage of um, cases which have mutated RAS. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about how a mutation on RAS uh, will cause cancer? Why, why is it that you have a mutation on that? You have yeah, so yeah, of course. So before I get into that, I'll just explain how RAS works. Mm -hmm. So it's a molecular switch, mm. which means that it's either on or off. And what determines if it's on or off is what it's able to bind to. So it can, if it binds to uh, something called GDP, then it's off. But if it binds to something called GTP, then it's on. So it really has only two states, and those two states are determined by what it's bound to. So and these GDP, GTP are just other molecules, other things inside of the cell? Yeah, like a molecule exactly okay similar a bit to um, uh, some of the molecules that would make up uh, DNA okay right um, so 
Right. Uh, in Cancer, RAS is mutated, and this mutation makes it so that it's constantly bound to GTP, which means that it's constantly on, it's constantly active. And in a normal context, you know, it can be turned on and on and off. And when it's on, uh, it can bind to different proteins in the cell, and these proteins are called RAS effectors. So an example of such a protein is uh, a protein called the RAF. And uh, this is another example of a protein that's uh, mutated in cancer. And so when uh, RAS is on, it binds to RAF and then activates RAF, which in turn interacts with other proteins in the cell. And the end result is that it's, it, it's telling the cell to grow or it's telling the cell uh, to divide and multiply. Huh. And in a normal context, that's all fine and well, but in cancer, when RAS is constantly on, uh, that leads to problems, that leads to tumors forming, etc. What might switch RAS on in a normal cell, in a cell that is non-cancerous? Uh, yes, yeah, so RAS has... Um, so as I said, RAS is on when it's bound to GTP, so... If it's bound to GDP, it's on, but it has other proteins that help it go from GTP to GDP or from GDP to GTP. Exactly, like if you have a light switch, these proteins would be the, the hand that clicks onto the light switch. Exactly, exactly. Um, and basically, uh, I understand better, <laughs> remember your question now, you, you want me to talk a bit about like, um, uh, receptors, right? So, if a, um, receptors are a type of protein that sits at the surface of the cell and um, gets signals from either other cells or um, in result to availability of nutrients, etc. So, when one of these receptor proteins is receives a signal. Uh, it's going to actually uh, lead to RAS being activated because RAS is, it, it's actually on the membrane of the cell, but on the inside. So it's, mm -hmm. it's quite close to that receptor. And so uh, that is kind of how uh, RAS gets activated in a normal, in a normal context. So it's, it's, if I understand well, RAS is this protein that when it's broken and it's always on, it tells the cell to divide uncontrollably. The cell just grows and divides and divides and divides. Exactly, exactly. Okay. okay. And how, how, is, how does your research relate to this routine? Uh, yeah, so I mentioned that uh, proteins with that RAS activates, those are called effectors. And most of these effectors are involved in you know telling the cell to grow telling the cell to divide mm -hmm. but there's some examples of effectors which actually have the opposite function so they tell the uh, cell to stop growing or in um you know extreme cases they'll tell the cell to actually kill itself and so an example of these proteins uh, is a family of 10 proteins called RASSF and uh, some of these proteins are, are thought to be effectors of RAS. However, there's still a lot of questions around this, and uh, we think that other proteins are kind of involved with RAS interacting with the RAS of Ceph's and then leading to a cellular response. And this is kind of where my project comes in. So you're saying in most cases, when RAS is activated, all the signals that uh, ensue are signals for the cells to proliferate, but then there's this RAS SF that does the opposite. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, I mean, an explanation for this could be that it's kind of like a safety mechanism. So in a normal context, you would not want to, the the growth signal to go on for too long so you would also have 
stop growth signal to prevent, you know, cancer developing. But in context of cancer, these ras proteins are actually being silenced. So mm. they're less, in many cancers, they're less active because the cancer cells don't want that signal to stop growing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so your research is studying the interactions between these RAS SF routines with RAS? Yes, yes. Okay. And um, more specifically, what I want to do as a starting point for my project is to find out all the proteins in the cell which interact with ra- the RAS SFs or with RAS. And these proteins, we can't even see them with a microscope, you said. So we're trying to find if two things we can't see touch. Yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's fairly uh, not easy, but there are many techniques to do it if you were just looking at two proteins. But it becomes even more complicated when you want to see all the proteins that one protein interacts with. Mm-hmm. And oh. so this is yeah this is where my my project comes in. It uses a technique called BioID, which the aim is exactly this. It's to um, find all the proteins that a given protein interacts with in the cell. This world of protein is such a complex world, right? Because you have this one protein RAS, and it interacts with. How many proteins, basically? How many other proteins? Tens? Hundreds? Hundreds. Hundreds, hundreds of yeah. other proteins. Yeah. And this, again, is based on the amino acid sequence. So RAS might have like some, some part of its surface that's negatively charged. And then all the proteins that have a bit of positive charge, they interact with RAS or something like that. And you're trying to identify it with, with BioID all the proteins that might, that might interact with RAS. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And what is what is this bio ID? Can you yeah yeah I can try simple terms? Yeah. Let's yeah. explain yeah. how how yeah. it works. So uh, let's say I'm starting with RAS. This is like my protein of interest. It's called the bait, and it's go it's going to be attached to another protein called BRA. And what this BRA protein does is it adds a, a little tag called biotin to other proteins. What? You're able to make a protein made of two proteins? How, how does that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, do, I, I don't know how to explain it in a simple manner, but basically, you, uh, like we explained, one gene will uh, encode for one protein. Well, if you uh, make a piece of DNA that has two genes next to each other without any Um, anything telling the ribosome to stop in between, then the ribosome will pretty much make the, the two proteins so that they're stuck to each other. So yeah, you're attached stitching together. You're stitching two little pieces of DNA, one that makes RAS and one that makes beer A, and then you have a protein, a double protein. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, a fusion <laughs> okay. protein, a recombinant protein. And you call this your bait, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so... In the cell, any proteins that come close to the bait, they'll have that tag, biotin, added to them. And so, because they have this tag, you can then... How is the tag added? It's added by BRA. Oh, so okay. BRA, so, yeah. It's, so, BRA is a type of protein that adds this biotin tag to other proteins? Exactly, okay. exactly. Um, and so, then those proteins with the biotin tag can be... Uh, purified so you can isolate just those proteins you'll have them in your um, you know in your tube you'll have just those proteins huh. and then you can use other methods to determine what those proteins are mm. so what you end up is with is a list of all the proteins that interact with the bait Mm. Huh. So basically you have the, the RAS, that is the bait, like you say, and every time something interacts, BRA comes in and tags it, and it tags it, and it tags it, while the proteins are in the cells. Exactly. And then you burst the cells apart, 
and you find the tag and you find a way to isolate the tag and everything that has a tag has interacted with Rust. Exactly. Oh, I, I have I have a cool analogy for that. That might make it go easy. For it. Go for uh, it. Imagine if uh, you're in a crowded room and there's one person in there that has a I don't know strawberry perfume and they're just spraying strawberry perfume <laughs> around. This would be the bait, and the strawberry perfume is the biotin. Uh, the biotin. The biotin. Yes. So they're spraying perfume. Anyone that comes close to the person spraying perfume will smell like strawberry. And then these people just go to another room and there's <laughs> someone else that just smells their neck or something or like, you smell like perfume, you were close to this protein or to this other person. More or less like this? Exactly, okay, exactly. Okay. And <laughs> also I should... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also, good. I should add that, uh, let's say a given protein, there's going to be many copies of it in the cell, many molecules of the same protein. Mm. And so with time, you know, this perfume spraying happens for like 24 hours. So you'll have proteins which interact more will have more molecules which end up being tagged. And so that allows you to have like a number at the end so you can tell which proteins uh, interact more mm. and which interact less out of that final list. Basically, if this... Uh person spreading perfume is my best friend, I will end up smelling a lot like their perfume. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you spend more time with them, you'll, you'll, you'll smell, smell more. more. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So if, if I understand well, that's the beginning of the project. You're trying to see which proteins will smell like perfume or which proteins will be tagged with biotin because they were close to rats. Once you have a list of proteins, what do you plan to do with the list? Yeah, so coming back to like the main question that I, I, I think I alluded to before, it's like how does RAS work with RASSF to activate these, you know, these signals that tell the cell to do something? Um, because it's really, it's really unclear. We, there's probably other proteins involved. So it's really a question of then comparing the different uh, lists of proteins. So if I have a list for ras -SF, I have a list for RAS, I have a list, uh, you know, and I'm comparing like that to see overlap, to see which proteins might be involved in this process. Uh, for example, if in your list with RAS, you have ras -SF, then the question could be, what is on the list of ras -SF? And then what is on the list of that protein? And you can go and find out all yeah, the interactions. Yeah, so yeah. if you have if you have a protein on the list of RAS, and that same protein shows up in the list of RASF, could you be able to say that that protein interacts with RAS because of RASF or something like that? Um, I mean, it it would be like a hypothesis at that point. It mm -hmm. wouldn't be like a definitive thing that I would have proven because the bio ID it, like it it gives you this list, but then you have to go and actually check that these two proteins are actually interacting and that that interaction actually has uh, some effect, some result. And so my project after that would be to use other techniques to actually verify this interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once we have that information, how can we understand better cancer and how to fight it, for example? Yeah, so um, one thing I didn't really touch on is the fact that um, there aren't uh, currently any treatments or that target RAS directly in cancer. There what would the, the idea of this treatment be, if it would exist? Yeah, so um, it would be, uh, for example, a, a molecule, a drug, that would um, bind to RAS and that would prevent it, for example, to bind to its effectors, or it would... You, you, I would, tar I would preferably target the RAS molecules with the mutation over the wild type or the normal. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop myself from using such terms, but wild yeah, from type. the no the normal RAS molecules which don't have the mutation, right? But the thing is, uh, it's only recently that such molecules were discovered, so they aren't being used as treatments as of now. And really, a lot of the um, 
research on t- to find cancer treatments for cancers which have RAS mutation has been focused on the effectors of RAS, for example, RAF, which I mentioned earlier. And from the other side, I think it's very important to study the the, the RAS effectors which have the opposite effect, as I mentioned, like ras which have the uh, the the function of telling the st- the cell to stop growing and um, finding ways maybe like this is just like an example like finding a way in a in a cancer that has a ras mutation to activate those ras SFs in order to um, have a sort of treatment for that for that cancer right? right so but in order to do such a thing you need to first understand how ras is working with the ras mm-hmm. cells which is what my project is doing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so your project is uh, basically building knowledge so that in the future someone can use that knowledge that you will have created to make a drug that can be used in cancer treatment. yeah okay. yeah yeah and uh, a lot of Research in molecular biology has kind of that purpose, mm-hmm. really uh, building the foundation so that other researchers can develop treatments, drugs, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Slow and steady. Slow and steady. <laughs> Slow and steady, exactly. You need to understand the principle. After the principle, you start thinking about how to stop this principle. And then after that, you can maybe do clinical trials. Exactly, yeah. It's a long process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really want to call this episode uh, Fantastic Proteins and How to See Them. And and so I would really like to talk about how can we see these proteins even though uh, we can't see them under the microscope or in any other way, right? Because you said, for example, the actin is like a rope. How do we know that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a really good question, and there's uh, different techniques to do that for sure. Um, so one example, which is really gaining in popularity, is a technique called uh, cryo EM, so cryo cryo electron microscopy. That sounds so sciencey. Yes, it, it sounds sciencey. <laughs> so instead of you know an electron microscope, instead of using light to see objects it uses electrons um and can we can why can't we see proteins with light Mm -hmm. um it has to do with the properties of light the wavelength is limiting the resolution at which you can you can see things they're just too small Mm -hmm. like even light it's mostly that the proteins are smaller than the wavelength of the light right Is that too complex for, for I don't know. We, yeah, yeah. So we, we can see proteins with not light. We need electrons. Yeah, exactly. Is what you're exactly. And a cryo EM takes it a step further. Further, it's doing electron microscopy at like very, very low temperatures, at cryo temperatures, in order to kind of uh, preserve, I guess, preserve the, the, the cell as much as possible, preserve the proteins as much as possible. Um, and yeah, there's been a lot of advances in, in with this technique recently, and now we can see proteins with this technique. Like, you can see, um, I, I don't know, like, what the, the smallest protein we've seen, but it, it is quite quite exciting, quite interesting. So that's just, I mean, that's just one technique, but it's, it's a big Cryo-EM. one. Cryo-EM. Yeah. So when we, when we see these proteins in the end, we look at it with the electron microscope and we can see all the little amino acids, where they are and what orientation to all X relative to each other and all that stuff. I, I mean, it depends. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the, the more, um, the more structured the protein, like the more, uh, I don't know how to use a better word than structure, like stable the protein, the, the better we'd be able to to see to such detail, but... Uh, Some proteins are more wiggly, you say, and it's harder to, say yeah, to see the detail. Yeah, if uh, proteins are like more flexible in a way, if mm. their structure kind of changes a bit with uh, with time, then it'd be a little bit more difficult to see it. It's yeah. like taking a picture of someone who's running, right? You might see that it's a bit blurry if uh, if they're in movement and yeah, they're, exactly, they're exactly. wiggling around. Mm-hmm. 
Are there any other techniques that you know about that we yeah. can use to yeah, see another, Yeah, another technique to see uh, a structure of a protein is called X-ray crystallography. Mm-hmm. Um, and this relies on crystals. Which, crystals? Yeah, yeah. So uh, think about how ice is a crystal of water molecules. So a crystal is um, something where the molecules are very well organized, like they're organized in kind of like a grid. So it's very, uh, in a way, all the individual molecules have the same orientation or similar orientation. How do you even make a crystal? You make a crystal with a protein? Yeah, exactly. So it'd be a crystal where each individual molecule is a molecule of one specific protein. So you have to isolate it and to have it a lot of a yeah. Lot of this protein. yeah so that's exactly what you do so you, you isolate your protein and then um, you make the crystal I don't know if you if you want me to get into the details of how you make a crystal if you but... think it's cool enough but <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe you would be like better at explaining it than uh-huh. me perhaps fair enough but in the end you have you have very like concentrated yeah. protein and it becomes a little crystal exactly. is it a crystal you can see um yeah it's like big enough to to see it, but it, I mean, it's it's like still fairly small, right? Like you can see it under a, a microscope, right? But mm-hmm. it's not, uh, it's still like very, very small. <laughs> it's yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it, that crystal will have many copies of your protein, all organized, very, very organized. So the next step after that is to actually uh, shoot the crystal with x-rays. How sciencey is that? Oh, okay. yeah. Really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And depending on like the shape of the crystal, the x-rays will like, bounce off of the crystal in, in a different way. And uh, they'll be detected like on a detector and make like a, a pattern. And based on that pattern, you can like reconstruct what the protein looks like. Mm-hmm. Just based on how the x-ray bounces out of the proteins on the crystal. Yeah, yeah, because since the crystal is like a, a, it's pretty much like, a, how to say, like, it's the individual protein, which is like amplified. So the, the, the way that the crystal looks is a reflection of how the little protein looks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is... Yeah, when I learned about crystallography, that was the craziest thing. Because you have like these proteins and you clump them up and then you have the x-rays that you throw at it. It all sounds out of this world, you know, but people every day, they go to their lab and they just yeah. they just do that. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> it's pretty insane. Um, for you guys at home who are watching on YouTube, uh, we will put some pictures of uh, protein structures right now that will go on the screen and you can see what uh, what incredible structures you can have whenever uh, whenever you crystallize a protein and get its structure. If you didn't get that, Phil is really into crystallography. <laughs> it's cool, okay? <laughs> no, it is really cool. It's the most sciencey stuff we have, so... <laughs> and, okay, all, all scientists have a favorite... Pro- no, not all scientists. All molecular biologists basically have a favorite protein. Would you say that's uh, that's mostly the case? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> what is yours? It's it's Rasef, no? Yeah, Rasef. Oh, Rasef. Ras yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm biased because that's what I'm. <laughs> that's what my research is on. But uh, it's always like this. You yeah. you get attributed a protein the first time you go to the lab, and then you fall in love with the protein. <laughs> it's yeah. like an arranged marriage with yeah. uh, with your protein. What is your favorite protein? Like protein feel? It's called G3P1. <laughs> G3BP1. That's a big name. And it has RAS in its name. Very, It's very funny. It's called RAS Gap Binding Protein 3. Uh, so it's involved and with the Maya stuff. It's involved with Maya stuff. It binds the same thing that RAS binds. And I think when Maya is going to do its BioID, G3BP1 might come up. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, we'll see. And so <laughs> our research is related. Um, are there other topics we want to talk about? We just broke the 40 minutes we attributed to ourselves. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about proteomics and more generally and how we went from a target-based approach to 
approach to uh, studying? Yeah, sure, Networks. sure. Yeah, so what is proteomics? Maybe we can define first. Mm -hmm. So the proteome is basically all the proteins, like the ensemble of all proteins. For example, human proteome, all the proteins in human cells. And proteomics is really the study of that. It's a fancy word, eh? Yeah, people yeah. often hear uh, the word genomics or genome. I think that's what the public outside are more used to. Uh, so is it kind of the same, but instead of talking about genes, we're talking about proteins? Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, more and more research in my field is moving kind of towards that approach, right? Just how uh, in the field of genetics, we move to genomics. It's same, same here, like people are more and more looking at proteins in the context of a bigger picture. So we know, like we, like we talked about, one protein interacts with hundreds of other proteins. And of course, for, for our human brains, it's like much easier to comprehend like one protein interacting with the second protein, interacting with a third in a kind of a linear fashion. But that's, that's not necessarily reflective of reality. So like, more and more now we have these proteomic techniques. BioID is an example of a proteomic technique. I have a pondering about this. I'm like, when we study these protein interactions in a linear way, our brains understand it very easily, right? But when we go and do proteomics, it's like some sort of net or some sort of spider web, right? We have one protein and it goes in all directions and it's very hard for our minds to grapple with these concepts. So I'm wondering how much understanding, and it's not a question for you, it's more of a pondering for everyone, how much understanding will we ever reach? Will we, will we be able to really understand what all of these networks do? Or will we only have a way like to predict what happens rather than really understanding what these networks do? I think at the end of the day, we might just end up with uh, computers doing all the work, right? We have all of the, the proteomics system, however we study it, uh, in a computer simulation. And if we want to know if what will happen if we move this routine, the computer will just simulate everything that might happen and give us a result. But that's a prediction, prediction not an explanation. It's not, yeah. sa it's not as satisfying. And this, this kind of alludes to the fact that there might be a limit to what we can understand. Mm, mm. And yeah, that's just fascinating to think we might have reached this threshold or we will reach this threshold of what is possible to understand versus predict mm. soon. Mm. Yeah, man, this is deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, with all the advances in, in AI, I'm sure that that's like the step we're going towards. And mm. of course, like... I feel like as scientists, our reflex is like, I want to understand exactly how this works. But at the end of the day, it's like also, uh, you know, in, in terms of like developing treatments and so on, you don't necessarily need to understand exactly how it works. You just need to... If it cures have, cancer, yeah, we're going to... Take it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, you say your, your lab and your research is going towards proteomics itself. How much computer computer science and coding and computer stuff do you need for this type of research? Uh, well, I, I don't do any coding or computer science on mm. my day to day, but I do think it's definitely like an asset to have. It's definitely useful. Um, I know like a lot of the softwares that I'm using, they were developed by programmers and, and, and so on. Um, you know, not like just by in other people in research labs. Bioinformaticians, yeah, people exactly, who are specialized exactly, yeah. in. Um, who would have thought this would be a job someday, you know? Bioinformatics. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for coming, Maya. It was a great pleasure to talk about RAS, proteins, genes, and all of the above. I hope. Uh, we did a good job of uh, doing some vulgarization and making it simple for everyone at home. And thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Orders of Magnitude. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a 5 stars rating on Apple Podcast and share the episode with your friends and family. If you would like to give us feedback, you can reach us at ordersofmagnitudepod at gmail.com. We would love to hear your opinions and ideas on the subject that we discussed today. Orders of Magnitude is an original project led by Philippe Carle and Matthias Schultz. The original music was composed by Vincent Elis. Stay tuned for the next episode coming out in two weeks. <laughs>